second time around to ERE, take a topic and we grapple with it mightily. And uh, so what you have here now in this uh, one hour session here, and by the way, as a little preface to this, you will see that on this session and we've done in the past couple times here at Nehruut and you'll obviously, because uh, President Wagner mentioned it uh, earlier in, in the conference and put us on notice that the Nehruut NASIO Task Force it was a report back to uh, Nehru in November. We are obviously building toward a report in November on the good work we're doing in the Nehru Nazio Task Force. That is a task force that is focusing on electric system planning. And it's Nehru Nazio to bring together the Nehru side, which is the regulatory experts, and Nazio, which is basically your state energy policy expertise, and looking at the quickly emerging world of how different aspects of utility and utility regulatory planning practices, which currently kind of operate in different ways on their own. And by that I mean uh, resource planning or integrated resource planning, as many folks know it, transmission planning, and then the emergence of distribution system planning. And it's not about how to create distribution system planning, which is an adjunct to the session you're gonna have here in a minute, but it's how do all those fit together effectively in a rapidly changing world so that we are best implementing energy policy, invest in that some regulatory practices as pertains to planning. So that's that's the essence of this. And because here is Nehru, Nehru but we're partnering with NASIO and both for the Nehru folks who could not attend and for all of our NASIO colleagues, we are live streaming this session then. So folks can, and, and yeah, it is pretty darn exciting. Thank you for that, yeah. And it's good to know the audience is thrilled by that. And that, that's good. And so we are using that as an opportunity to both better communicate broaden our audience and share this. And by this, I mean that in this session here, we're going into one fairly specific aspect of the world of DERs, distributed energy resources, and how they fit into the distribution system and planning. And looking at the technical or tool side of this conversation, having to do with how exactly do you, do you dance with that new resource arena from a load forecasting or projection point of view? Because if you don't have the tools, a lot of this continues just to be sort of a hypothetical exercise. And so, so what we're using this hour now is a panel of three folks who are going to uh, help us through that conversation to look just exactly at that. Of how do you, what do we know, and how, what can we learn? What are the takeaways on, in the arena of load forecasting or system forecasting regarding distributed energy resources or DERs? So what you have in front of you now. So we're going to start from the perspective of the national labs, in this case the Pacific Northwest National Lab, or PNNL, and Juliet Homer will lead first and kind of set that context from what the labs have been able to uh, learn and share, uh, which is always a great use, and we do appreciate that partnership through DOE, the whole backbone of all the labs, because they can set that broad context and substantive depth for us. From there, we're going to move to Kevin Cushman, and he's president of Federal Analytics, and Kevin's here in large part because his firm has actually worked in this area of developing DER load forecasting tools. So he kind of knows the actual software and program that is in use in, in several of the utilities around the country. And it can help us look then at some of the lessons learned, best practices, uh, things to be aware of in this arena, emerging arena of load forecasting and DERs. Then we bring it down to the, to the specifics of the utility, in this case, Sacramento Municipal Utility District, or uh, SMUD, and Patrick McCoy is going to talk about their actual experience at SMUD doing this actual work. So that's the flow. Uh, that's the end of my remarks for you. I'm going to turn it over to Juliet first. I think we all have slides, and the live stream is going to turn towards slides. So thank you for being here. All right, my pleasure. Hello, everyone. I'm Juliet Homer from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. from Lawrence Berkeley Labs and Michael Coddington from NREL. I also borrowed some material from Debbie Liu from uh, formerly of GE Consulting. So when it comes to uh, load forecasting, it's been done over the years as part of integrated resource planning for those states that have done integrated resource planning, as well as distribution system planning. This isn't a brand new thing. It's just it's being talked about in a different way, but um, the, the type of 
flow forecasting and CPR planning that we're talking about here really um, has to do with this new kind of integrated um, distribution system planning. Figure on the left, uh, kind of traditional distribution system planning was uh, relatively straightforward, and with the introduction of increasing distributed energy resources, we can move to this more integrated uh, distribution system planning that includes things that we've heard about today, things like hosting capacity analysis, home wires, alternatives, and really looking carefully at the types of services that DERs can provide, as well as the investments required to enable those services. As this here shows, so what we're here to talk about today is really the first part of both traditional and more advanced integrated distribution system planning. That's determining what is the load that needs to be served. What is the amount of electricity that the utility or the provider needs to provide? And then what are the amount, how many uh, distributed energy resources will there be and where and what types? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about traditional load forecasting to start. Uh, traditional load forecasting utilities really was focused on peak. So what was the peak doing over time and how did that relate to the capacity of the existing peers? And so there was kind of tracking over time. How are we doing? Are we reaching the capacity of the peers? And if so, when do those need to be upgraded? What about the substations? What needs to happen there? Um, so it's really been a focus on just tracking peak load over time and addressing things like new subdivisions and, and that sort of thing. The types of tools that were used to do this are some of the kind of traditional tools that utilities use distribution system analysis tools like science, synergy, and real soft. So in terms of DDR planning, um, uh, the more traditional types of planning for DDRs or projecting DDRs, some of them have been quite simple. Um, some utilities have just looked at historical um, uh, penetration levels, kind of done percentage, and then extrapolate that moving forward. Other, in other cases, the amount of DERs have been tried to project as a target. If the state or utility has a target amount for DERs, they would assume, okay, we'll assume we'll use that amount of DERs by that date. Um, other, a little bit more advanced methods were to do regression rate based analyses, so correlating the DER growth with other variables on the system and projecting those going forward. And that traditionally had been done kind of at the whole utility system level rather than at a more granular level. And then, of course, planner's judgment often came into play, and that was used as part of um, projecting DDRs. So I think there's a, a, a thinking that going forward, we need to move beyond these. Um, okay, thank you. Um, going forward, we need to move beyond these into some more advanced methods, as we'll talk about those here. So um, there's a move towards more granular mode forecasting and DDRs. Our forecasting. Uh, my colleague Kevin Schneider likes to say that when people ask the question, what's the value of solar? The answer of solar PV, the answer really is it depends. It depends on where it is in the system, what time of day, um, and so that's reflected in the move towards more granular um, load forecasting, DER forecasting. There's also been a move to multiple scenario forecasts, so looking at potential different um, scenarios for DERs and making sure that the system and looking at the impacts of those different scenarios on the system. So the figure here shows for one utility a low base and high uh, DER deployment um, potential and so regulators have the opportunity to work with utilities on defining different scenarios that can be used and some of those that have been used are things like a, a business as usual case or cases with varying DER growth projections varying amounts of energy efficiency, demand response, EVs, and distributed generation, and maybe scenarios that reflect different cost changes for certain types of DERs, as well as sustainability or carbon goals type scenarios. So a good question one might ask is, well, what should be the basis of these scenarios? And there's this last bullet talks about some resources that can be used to help inform scenarios. And those include things like market analysis reports, I know in some cases, utilities will hire consultants to do assessments, potential assessments, and say, what is the energy efficiency potential in my service territory? What is the demand response potential? How much DER might there be? And so these third party or these kind of independent studies can be really helpful for regulators to, uh, to look at and also to even help define it and look at how they're scoped out. Um, another thing 
that can be of interest when looking at utility projections is to compare with third party projections. You know, depending on who did projections, you think need to be taken with a grain of salt, but that conversation between what the utility is projecting and maybe what others are projecting and why they're the same, why they're different, that can be very useful. Okay, so in terms of more advanced um, load and DER forecasting, so rather than kind of just looking at the historical methods, there's move towards more customer adoption modeling to look at specifically at what customers will be adopting DERs most likely. Um, and some of the drivers to consider in customer adoption modeling are things like potential savings to different classes of customers, there's clustering effects, sometimes um, communities in residents and, you know, see their neighbors and they also want to jump on the, on the bus of getting solar or solar storage. Um, there may be green customers who are more likely to adopt DERs. Um, or customers interested in self-sufficiency, or customers with certain income levels. And customer surveys um, and information on existing installations and information on the queue of existing utilities can be helpful to also inform which customers might be adopting DERs. Okay, so here. Um, okay, in terms of the tools, um, there's a move towards more spatial, like I said, spatial load forecasting tools. And as I've looked around at some of the most innovative utilities, a lot of them seem to be using this tool, Loadseer, to provide really granular um, projections for loads. And the good thing is our next panelist, Kevin, is his company developed that tool. So a lot of uh, advanced utilities are using it. But in terms of tools that actually help project the DERs, where they'll be, how many, what kind, there really aren't um, mature uh, commercial tools that help do this. Um, but you do see a lot of the advanced utilities using uh, this method called the mass diffusion method that really helps to describe how innovation is adopted and spreads over time. So this mass diffusion methodology has been used in many different industries and now it's being applied effectively to energy. Um, and it, it's based on the theory of early adopters influencing later adopters. Um, and there's some also other new methods coming out that really rely on things like machine learning and advanced modeling. And these are still kind of in the emerging phase. Uh, one called Watt Plan Grid is being developed. And our third panelist, Patrick, is with SMUD, and they're part of the team that's helping to develop that tool. Okay, next. Okay, so I'm going to give some examples of some utilities that are using some of these methods, and I'll talk a little bit about states and wrap it up. So in terms of utilities, um, you know, California utilities are required to do integrated, uh, or sorry, distribution resource plans. And as part of those requirements, they are required to develop 10-year DR growth scenarios. Um, and the scenarios that they're using in California are one, a trajectory um, scenario, and then a high growth scenario, and then a very high growth scenario. Um, and in terms of uh, Pacific Gas and Electric in Southern California Edison, they're using this vast diffusion methodology to project the DERs. And then they're layering on top of that uh, impacts of specific policies in California that could also adopt uh, impact adoption, such as the zero net energy buildings requirements that require uh, PV or distributed generation on buildings. So these California utilities are then using a tool from NREL called PV Watts that's helping them to say, okay, once we've got the DERs out there, how, or for solar particularly, how much energy will these solar systems be developing? What will that look like over, over the day? Um, and then what they're doing is they're, they're taking really granular look at the load shapes for different customer classes. So they get their load shape for different customer classes, they layer on top of that the distributed um, solar and the load shape for that, and that's the way they're coming up with their net load shape that the utility needs to address. Another example um, is here with Con Edison. New York. Um, and this is a nice figure that just demonstrates how they're going about calculating the peak load. Um, they've got their weather adjusted peak demand and then they um, add to that the projected residential, commercial, and industrial growth as well as growth from uh, projected EVs and other technologies. And then they take that peak and then they reduce from that energy efficiency, demand response, distributed generation, and then location-specific load management, such as non-wires alternatives, to come up with their forecasted peak. And the table here kind of shows uh, in numbers how they're doing that. And I think commissions and commission staff have the opportunity to really ask a lot of questions about each of these items. And they can kind of push back on some of them and ask for what are the assumptions around these? Are there, are there any 
these studies or research um, to support these. So these are all areas that commission staff can engage with utilities to look at these important numbers. All right, next. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about two states that are engaging with their utilities in load and DR forecasts versus um, Minnesota. They've got a distribution planning proceeding and they have requirements for the utilities. And they're requiring their utilities to report on things like what's the current DER deployment, type, size, and geographic dispersion. And then are there areas of projected high DER forecasts? Um, they are requiring utilities to develop, to define and develop cases for low, medium, and high uh, DER integration. And then talk about methods used to develop those use cases and processes and tools necessary to accommodate different levels of DERs. Minnesota also requires a hosting capacity analysis from the utilities. The next state I'll talk about here is Oregon. Um, they're just getting going on a distribution system planning docket. And they decided that before they start making requirements for um, DERs or load forecasts, they're going to ask and understand what is the utility currently doing. So, much like Minnesota, they first sent out a survey to the utilities to ask them, tell us in detail, how, how granular are your projections? How are you looking at scenarios now? Um, what is the current state of DERs? So they're kind of gathering information from there, then they'll uh, develop requirements uh, for reporting and uh, maybe some guidelines on, on load and DER forecasts. And my last slide here, just a few closing thoughts. Distribution system planning at the core is really about investment decisions. And utilities base investments on identified need. And the need can change, needs change as customers adopt distributed energy resources. So DERs can decrease investment needs um, because in large part, customers are paying to install these, um, this equipment. This is less the utility has to pay to install. So in those cases, it can actually decrease investment needs. In other cases, the DERs can increase utility investment needs. There may be proactive uh, hosting capacity investments that would be made uh, or other grid support type investments. But it's, the challenge here is that these DERs are being adopted outside of the utility planning system, and utilities don't know where they're going to go or how they're going to be operated, and yet the utilities are still required to maintain system reliability. So that's a challenge. And then the last point here is that inaccurate DR projections actually can have, have costs associated with them. They can increase capital and operating costs. And NREL actually has a really nice report that quantifies the cost of, in, of, of poor DR projections. And the other interesting thing here is that rate design can really influence um, how much DERs are, are installed. And so this is kind of almost a circular thing. And regulators and utilities can work together to use tariffs um, as mechanisms for influencing DER scenarios um, going forward. Thank you, Julia. And as we pass along to Kevin, just one quick question for you. And it goes to your very last key challenge there. And to uh, when you were talking about the diffusion method, and then you're talking about that challenge, that it all comes down to forecasting what is how much DR adoption. Do those methods take into consideration that, that you have the utility both forecasting and doing different things that control adoption? They, they affect interconnection. They affect adoption through rates. They affect uh, just the tone that's set in the market in some ways. How does that, or does that get factored into trying to figure out, because, you, know, you know, they're in, they're on two sides of that conversation. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I don't know the details of how that's included in the vast division, but it, that's a big, big challenge. Yeah, so it's often the challenge as a regulator is the different points of contact with the utility. Um, to that, then, we're going to work our way into more detail. So, Kevin. Thank you very much, Chairman Ackerman. So my name is Kevin Cushman, and I'm here with Integral Analytics, and we're a data science software business that's been in the utility uh, arena for about 15 years. We provide software applications to not only utilities, but non-utilities, getting in the DR wave uh, going on right now, but also uh, municipalities, which is kind of the 800-pound gorilla that seems to be moving off in the DER world here, irrespective of what happens in rooms like this. Um, so we think about Austin, Seattle, and uh, Salt River Project and groups that are doing things for other reasons beyond just recovery and ROE. It's actually happening to bolster uh, smart cities, uh, economic development. But before I get started on my slides, I wanted to mention uh, a comparison we're doing uh, in the office between two 
utilities uh, who are often compared almost as twin sisters, uh, Hawaiian Electric and Entergy. Um, and I think <laughs> <laughs> the reason I bring those up, uh, they do, uh, interestingly enough, have a lot, of, a lot of similar characteristics in terms of how they're approaching distribution system planning. One, obviously, in Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric under uh, the pressure and uh, laser focus of 100% renewable requirements, 100% uh, EV uh, goals with respect to the municipalities in Hawaii, and all of the interaction associated with providing customers choice at, at least cost in a captured environment for energy. And energy, where you have very little DDR adoption, uh, very little in terms of uh, telemetry or intelligence on the network itself. But what we found was there was an incredible push to build intelligence into how they were going to standardize plans which was very interesting for us uh, to see those two ends of the spectrum and all both merging uh, to the same answer, which is we have to get as granular and frequent and intelligent as we can in terms of how we want planners to take advantage of what's happening in the market, uh, both for things that they want to manage for programs, but also things that are outside of their control, things like electric vehicles. So as we go forward, keep those two examples in mind, and you may see that there's not, they're not as different as you so this, as a software business, really is the peak of our visual capability. Um, <laughs> we've heard the terms walk, dog, run a lot in the regulatory environment, just how to adopt process and procedure and build intelligent practices, uh, the utility. And um, when, when I hear walk, dog, run as a, a technology provider to the industry, I hear how, how slowly can we become intelligent instead of how quickly can we enable our teams to take advantage of so when you see walk, dog, run, the only folks that are actually walking still are the utilities in a lot of cases. And they deal with a ton of complexity, but at the same time, all the factors on the right-hand side of the folks that are running are not waiting on them to figure it out. They're expecting them to figure it out along the way. So there are different instances where uh, you may have a, a significant deployment of DER, significant adoption in places like California that's making reaction a real problem, whereas the opportunity to, to look ahead and plan ahead and build systems, build that architecture that allows you to manage and, and understand the risks associated with DR adoption. I think is uh, a given at this point in the conference um, around the room we can agree that the next 20 years are going to exist the evolution uh, in the electric infrastructure between the substation and the prosumer's device. A lot of these uh, top four uh, drivers are, are pretty well understood and through them individually, other than to say, when you think about what happens in a distribution uh, network on a feeder or in a line section, you think about number three, uh, things like solar clustering or who's adopted energy efficiency measures three, five, seven years ago, that they're now buying an EV, or they may be buying an EV, but their neighbor who shares the same transformer as a solar panel. How do those assets interact and create either opportunities, cost savings, or risk to that individual feeder? And then how do you aggregate risk upward into a system level view. Um, what it ultimately means is the load shapes that planners are going to need to adopt and, and use to adjust for risk and look at different scenarios are changing and they're volatile. They'll become more volatile as uh, DER adoption. So that is the broader context. What we're seeing several utilities do is start to merge traditionally have been very siloed operations, planning, IRP groups, corporate forecasting, and even the operations groups, who traditionally had been on a different floor of the planners, are all being brought together in groups called integrated grid plan. And they're sharing intelligence, sharing modeling, and looking to say, okay, if you're telling me this is what I believe is going to happen in this part of the network for the next year, how will that impact me in the next two days when I have a weather issue coming up? Or how do we look at cloud following for solar, and how does that impact told me what's going to happen in terms of adoption uh, for DER the last two years? Um, so that is important. Locational and temporal value of DER have to be considered. The ability to build capabilities inside the utility to run multiple scenarios and understand what multiple forecast methods are available now and start to build those muscles is also critical. So the objective being having a, a DER ready distribution network. On the left hand side, having a modern system to be able to accommodate expected DER growth, whether it's managed through utility programs or incentives or Coming, such as in the uh, 
uh, based on market desire. To include granular DER scenarios in the load planning and determine the costs and benefits associated with DER adoption in different releases and different times in the network. And then finally, to provide valuation metrics that allow for capital alternatives, non wireless alternatives, et cetera, and in some places are being mandated and in some places are just smart practice because you can actually deploy capital in a more surgical manner. Underpinning all of this is the ability to look at each circuit and look at it in an hourly environment and look at it multiple years out into the future and understand what the circuit load forecast uh, really portends for that part of the network. As Juliet mentioned, previous history and the legacy of distribution planning has been uh, the guys behind the great, great cubicle walls that somebody taps them on the shoulder in September and say, okay, your peaks are in, right? You've seen the summer peak, what are we doing? How does it look uh, for the next year or two? There we go, thank you. Traditionally a tops down, corporate forecast being allocated to individual feeders, almost in a peanut butter environment. What did we do last year? Was it a 1.6% overall system load growth expectation? Okay, spread that out to the feeders and let me know how it looks. How do we look in terms of risk uh, associated with that approach? Uh, based on historical regression, uh, primarily done down to the substation level um, and, and used in IRPs and focused on capital projects. Fairly large <laughs> it's clearly not an energy feed. Um, so that's, that's the status, status quo and, and a lot of things going on in Excel spreadsheets and, and with relatively static applications. And the rationale for not doing anything more, I think historically has been based on the fact that, oh, this is complex, we're not sure, there's a, a, a growing emergence of DER, but we're not exactly ready to take on the computational complexity or rigor. Um, and what we found over the last few years working with several utilities on the right-hand side is that it's just simply not true. There are commercially available applications that can solve for some of the, uh, building some of these underpinning uh, tenants for distribution planning as a dynamic process. As a granular process. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm getting played off at the Tonys or something. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, but ultimately, each one of these conventional wisdom rationale for standing back and waiting further has been debunked over time. And we have examples here, and I, I urge anyone in the audience to come up and, and happy to discuss any of these and how we were able to help utilities solve them. Importantly, there is no AMI requirement to become more intelligent about the distribution feeder. There is SCADA information. A lot of uh, utilities have sensor information. Hawaiian Electric and Entergy, neither of them have system-wide AMI deployments but they're still able to build customer uh, load shapes, circuit load shapes, with the reliability to be able to look forward five, 10 years based on what's coming down the pike in DER. So the idea of waiting until the entire network is deployed with AMI is really kind of a red herring in our view. This is something I would never ask anyone to explain, uh, let alone myself, but this is a, a DER and a load forecast planning scenario, uh, a practice which ultimately, when we sell software and we work with our, our utility customers, they end up adopting a process. We talked about integrated grid planning, what it means to incorporate multiple groups into the process, and that needs to happen much more frequently than in an annual basis or than in a, in a test year environment. And this is what we're talking about, is building in hourly loading, building load shapes, and understanding what spatial analysis and then ultimately scenario analysis around different DR adoption scenarios looks like. So we have the computational capacity. Amazon Web Services and Microsoft have done a pretty nice job building businesses around making computational capacity available. It's now available. Run a lot of analysis in a short amount of time and produce results that give you a distribution of financial outcomes. So building that into process is also important. I'll go through a few examples uh, of what uh, moving toward uh, distribution system planning intelligence is like. Ultimately, it's taking things like load forecast and stretching it out and understanding what it means to plan around 8760 load forecasts. What, it, what you're doing in terms of moving the, the uh, understanding down to the individual feeder of risks where DER is applied along the feeder, and what hourly resolution looks like. So essentially you're solving how the feeder will act on a daily basis and extending that and extrapolating that into the 10-year forecast environment. At the load shape level, what it allows you to do then when you have an adoption expectation or adoption forecast at the feeder level based on what's happening at the feeder level. The 
adoption of EV, the adoption of, of solar, and programs being offered in certain areas, you can create scenarios where you can almost put together micro IRPs, as we call them. So you're building up a distributed resources plan feeder by feeder and understanding how those resources will interact with the load as the load itself is actually changing. So you can become, as a utility, much more prescriptive and surgical about where you offer programs, how you tune incentives specific to the needs and specific to existing portfolios as you see them arriving on each feeder. So ultimately what we do is we offer an opportunity for utilities to say, okay, I have this situation, I think I know what the load shape will like over the next five to ten years. I know these investment horizons for DER and generally match that five, ten, twenty year investment horizon. How do I look at applying my current view of cost per KW or per KWH for those DER and run an optimization? Say how does this shake out not just for one iteration of the optimization but across an array of potential outcomes? And then you yeah, feel like you're armed as a distribution planner merged up with the way the ops guys will look at the, the uh, distribution day in and day out to make smart decisions. The last couple of slides I have talk about the integration upstream and what it means to have much more rigorous distribution planning and how it impacts the transmission network planning. And two areas that were typically siloed, and I think if you ask anyone from an RTO or an ISO, we're virtually blind from the substation down in terms of volatility and the impacts on the transmission planning and capacity. So if you start, start thinking about moving opportunities to look at DER impact and load forecasts up to the transmission level, looking at scenario planning again, and you're looking at doing IRPs in a much more rigorous event. Here's an example from a, uh, a customer we're working with. We look at the transmission constraints over a specific run, and then you look at the opportunity to look at what PV adoption may look like and what max PV and max battery adoption would look like. And then you start solving for those areas where PV and storage together would provide you a least cost solution to supplant other measures or initiatives that you might want to uh, undertake uh, to alleviate the transmission. And down to a feeder level, each one of those feeders supporting that substation has its own solution for that exact same question. So as storage costs come down, which feeders are more likely and, more, and least cost to adopt storage more quickly to solve that transmission constraint issue? It's not just at the feeder head, it's along the circuit. So the same question answered at the feeder, where should PV and or storage end up along the feeder at each, at each line section to attack that specific load volatility threat or that risk? All again, solving for least cost, highest customer choice capability, and most flexibility in terms of intraday operations. And finally, uh, the point I'd leave you with is, this is about speed to intelligence. We talked about coming smart quickly, versus slowly, um, proliferation is starting. A ton of money has been invested in things like not just AMI, but also sensor information, uh, MDMS systems, ADMS systems. The information is there, it's housed, it's accessible, and a lot of states have already put in place the environment to move this forward. Um, Mr. Ackerman asked us to present one idea uh, that commissioners should consider when they're thinking about distribution system planning. And at the bottom I said, set a standard. The information is available, computational capacity is there, cost is not exorbitant, and it pales in comparison to the misallocation of capital at the digital level. It requires circuit level risk analysis every year. If you have 5,000 circuits, you might have to run a couple of computer programs. But if you have 200, 300, 400 circuits, find the highest risk circuits and present that as part of the backstop for why your capital can Kevin, thank, thank you. No, that you covered a lot of detail. Appreciate you hitting right, right in that spot. Uh, and a lot of that, that I'll admit, is hard to absorb in first blush. But let me ask one or two, I think, uh, questions as we transition to talking about this from a specific utility. And what I'm getting at is your opening point about variable load going on here. There's two things that I'm interested in there. But one is when. The essence of, when you're not going to be able to control the variability, you acknowledge the variability is there. One question is, does that uh, put a value on resources that can better respond to variability? And is that factored into analysis? That's sort of question one. So the answer is yes. When we look at an optimization, if you're thinking about the variability and running scenarios around that variability, how do you think about uh, load factor and, and performance of those assets? I'll 
following that feeder. So what pulls in under the circumstance of cloudy weather or weather anomalous, extreme weather, how those resources are pulled in to solve that. That's helpful. And then second, when you were talking about your example about a feeder that might have a, le a least cost uh, approach to, to bringing on uh, new assets, are you in there, I hear, implied that then there would be a price signal sent to the folks on that feeder? I would say, for you, because it's least cost here, um, the dynamic between the customer and the utility is going to be set at a certain price. Are we talking about locational pricing? There, there's been a lot of talk about locational marginal pricing or LMP plus D uh, type pricing, and I think that is implied in what we're solving for here. There's an avoided cost per location, having specific assets at a specific location on the feeder at a specific time as an investment protocol, and then looking at that, how that plays out over time in terms of the bid ask, um, distributed marginal pricing, that sort of thing. It's unit transactive energy. We're talking about though is planning, using that mindset. So you actually think about the solution as you're clearing a market optimum, and the market being the feeder, and the market participants being the individualized DER, and how those market assets are clearing, but you have to back up and think about it from a planning perspective first. And that's really what this logic applies uh, in the outset. Thank you. I hope that helped as you can do follow-on questions in a few minutes and now that you're ready for that. We're going to go to Patrick at SMUD and appreciate you being here and to tell us about SMUD's particular experience with this. So. Uh, thank you. So, um, you know, when I, when I saw my colleagues' uh, presentation, I kind of thought, well, you know, what they said, thank you very much. <laughs> Good luck. But, but, but in reality, I, 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 what I wanted to do was to at least highlight some key takeaways based upon our experience to date. Um, I want to add one point, uh, or actually a couple points here that I think are important. Number one is theater level, yes. But what about that secondary circuit? I've had distribution planning engineers tell me, Patrick, I can see what's going on at that substation. I get a sense for what's going on in that feeder. But what I'm worried about is that secondary circuit where I can't see what's going on. I've got issues with serviceable transformers, right? I've got a residential customer who has 10 kW PV, who's got two Teslas in the garage, a couple of power walls on, on, in their garage, and now we're going we're gonna to try to get them to adopt you know, uh, electric appliances. What the heck is going to happen with that load? And then how's that 10 or 12 homes that are on that service transformer, how is that transformer going to, to act? What am I going to need to do? If you have tens of thousands of those service transformers, that could end up being a significant cost in terms of needing to update, or not update, but to, to modify those or replace them. Uh, we also worry about uh, conduits, right? Are you starting to reach that thermal limits on your conduits? Do you need to replace your conduits? So I think it's, it's, it's also important to consider a little more granularity than just a few of them. Nonetheless, uh, I wanted to make that point because we're thinking about that. The second point I want to make is I think a lot of times uh, we at SMUD are trying to take more of a customer-centric point of view, right? A lot of times you hear what you hear other people say is a very utility-specific point of view. But you know, at the end of the day, with the democratization of our grid, customers are increasingly in control, and they're becoming very demanding, um, and unfortunately some of them are becoming kind of sneaky to a certain extent. Nonetheless, <laughs> um, what I'd like to suggest here as key takeaways is it's difficult. It's very challenging. Our work with Clean Power Research and Walk Plan Grid has proven that to, to be a fact. Um, they wrote a white paper that they submitted to the California Energy Commission. I couldn't find it online, but it's, it's a part of an epic grant where they evaluated the vast technology diffusion model and rejected it because they said there's not enough levers and dials that you can change. Right now we're using a multivariate linear regression model, but they're going to move to a logistic regression model because they say something about better curve feeding. So it's, it's challenging, it's very difficult if we're talking about DER forecasting on not a, just a geospatial basis, but a temporal. Right? Because when are customers going to make that investment? Gives you an idea of when can I expect or anticipate problems to occur, which then lets me know when should I plan on making that capex. So there's a, there's a timing issue here that we believe is important. Um, there's going to be a cost. Going to be cost to it. You got to get the tools. Fortunately, SMUD did roll out an EMI uh, network. Not only that, during our solar incentive program days, we required PV production meters to be installed as well. And that's proven to be a huge boon for us in terms of understanding 
Because when you're just looking at a net load profile, there's a lot there that's missing that you don't know what's going on because the PV system has a tendency to mask that. So we were, we were fortunate. Somebody made a decision. Somebody made a smart decision. The other point I want to make is there are new players at the table. You know, before I think it used to be just regulators and utilities with some consumer advocates, uh, environmental advocates came into the picture. But now you're seeing customer groups show up, other associations show up that are board here, you know, demanding that, that utilities do this and that. So uh, those are some other things that I think that are important to think about. Um, integrated planning, yes, but how? Um, we're struggling a bit at SMUD to try to figure this out because uh, it's actually a lot harder, at least in our experience, to break down those silos. And, you know, when you go talk to the distribution planning engineers, they're like, oh my God, don't bug me, Patrick, with all this DR stuff, you're driving me crazy, right? I plan on just peak and when it occurs. We're going to try over the next several years, hopefully not that long, to convince them, no, 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 it's a little more than that. You need to think about some of these other things as well. I chose a Venn diagram because it, 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 I think it best represents how interrelated these are in a reflection of the integrated planning, right? If you can forecast DR, well, first of all, hosting capacity analysis, a lot of utilities have already been doing that. So that doesn't seem to be all that problematic unless it's a static view of that hosting capacity analysis, right? You need to move into more of a dynamic or as things are interconnected, that hosting capacity uh, analysis or that map is continuously updated. From there then, I think you can then move into a locational net benefit analysis. You know what's going on in, on the grid. You've got your DR forecast, so you can kind of anticipate things in the future. Now you start to consider where are the, the locations that I can drive some, some net benefits. You know, our distribution operators who are currently implementing a distributed energy resource management system, or DERMS, um, their policy call is they want visibility, they want control. Now, I don't know if everybody, every utility wants that or not, but that's what SMUD's distribution operators want. They believe it's important, uh, which is why it's going to cost them in order to do that. But transparency is also important. And the reason I say this is because um, transparency and, and ownership, ownership of the assets, ownership of the data. So here's a story I like to tell. Several years ago, we met with a, smart, with a, with a solar inverter company. And we said, you know, we really love what you're doing. It's, it's going to be really great if you can just interface with your system. We can get the data. We don't have to keep paying for these EV generation meters. It's costing us several million dollars a year. And they went, hold it. First of all, that data doesn't belong to you belongs to us. We have a relationship with the host customer. Matter of fact, we enter into a data privacy agreement with the host customer. Therefore, if you want access to that data, first you have to get our permission. But more importantly, you have to get the customer's permission as well to access that data. So of course that conversation came to a complete company call. Because but it was the first time we were faced with that situation where you've got third parties now that control and own data. And they understand the value of it. So transparency and ownership are a couple of other things that are at least embedded within this diagram. It's going to be very important uh, to, to, for regulators to, to think about that. Data ownership. It's not just about utilities anymore. It's about customers and third parties that are part of the conversation. Okay. I wanted to touch upon scenarios. You know, this is just a handful of scenarios here. I chose this graphic because I wanted to demonstrate easy, relatively speaking, to hard. Right. And so the spectrum of scenarios I thought was, um, you'll see in the next slide why, why it's a lead into my, my next slide here, where actually we had an actual experience. Um, because there's lots of scenarios that are not listed here. Right. One of the scenarios that our load research and forecasting folks just told me about was, you know, Patrick, if we do everything that you guys are strategizing about, when it comes to PV, battery storage, uh, EVs, building electrification, so on and so forth. We are going to go, by 2040, we will go from a July weekday 5 to 8 peaking utility to a December 24th, midnight to 2 or 2 to 4 in the morning 
it would become a winter peaking utility. And that caused everybody to just kind of pause and go, so what are the ramifications of that? What are the issues associated with that? Um, so these are things that I know we're going to continue to investigate and wrestle with. What happens when your system peak changes? That's, it, it, was, it was pretty, uh, pretty mind-blowing there. Um, you know, and some of the other scenarios that are this, uh, aren't listed here, right? The velocity of change. What's, what's, that, what's that velocity vector when it comes to change in technology, change in costs? My executive is always hounding us about what is that tipping point when mass adoption will occur of these technologies. And, and we struggle with that because we really don't know. The DR forecasting hopefully will give us some insight and clues into that. Um, misalignment of business and planning cycles. You know, in our group, we want to move to integrated planning. Uh, customers should have a seat at the table. It's not just about the distribution of planning engineers or the great asset managers. So the customer has to have a seat at the table. The customer only looks out three years. Distribution planning looks out five years. You go to resource planning, they look out 20 years. That's understandable if you're procuring long with assets. But these business cycles, um, we think we need to either come up with a better way to align them or come up with some master planning schedule when all of these things fit into place. And we're starting to gravitate towards that with regards to scheduling things. Us, we in the distributed energy strategy group have to have our strategies developed, reviewed, approved by the end of this year for next year's planning cycle, for example. Because then that feeds in to all the other business cycles. Um, you know, and the other thing too that we're noticing, we're experiencing is Pressure by other market actors and jurisdictions. City of Sacramento goes, we want to be 100% green. Unfortunately, not on your time. So what are we going to do about that? We have specific customers. The state of California is one of our largest customers. We want this, we want that, and we need, we need the governor's executive order, so on and so forth. So these are things, these are other scenarios that start to become not only very important, but complicated to then fit into all the other things you're trying to do which is just trying to keep the grid stable and reliable so we get trouble with America. Uh, so, my example. We, like a lot of other utilities in California, we're trying to figure out what is our M2.0. So, the case study I chose here was net metering meter. We just went through uh, this with our 2019 rate action. Uh, the scenario that I've chosen is fixed cost recovery because, in fact, that's what our CFO chose. They wanted to create an M2.0 that addressed revenue erosion and, in a sense, uh, addressed fixed cost recovery. So that was the objective. So what were some of the options? Uh, I listed full retail credit there, but that requires a dramatic change in the rate itself. That was your objective. Uh, we looked at non-bypassable charges. We looked at demand charge. We landed on a grid access charge. At least what we call it a grid access charge. The question then that we in the distributed energy strategy group posed was, well, what's that going to do to PV adoption? So we utilized the tool. Um, lots and lots of data that goes into that tool. I don't know if it's just because we're smud, different, but uh, our customer uh, research folks have a tremendous amount of data on our customers, predominantly residential. Commercial is a really tough nut to crack. But we use Prism data, right? segmentation, we bring all of that into the tool to try to figure these things out. What we discovered was that the PV adoption rate for residential almost went to zero for six to eight years. We presented that to our CFO and he said, okay, we understand, but we'll go ahead and move forward with this. The outcome was, of course, as you can imagine, a tremendous outcry, lots of bad press, and uh, the smug board said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys need to go back and redo this and come back to us with a proposal that kind of walks a, a, maybe a tightrope here in terms of policy, politics, market reaction, or our customers' work. Um, we've also found out, you know, our experience to date is it's a lot of data. We believe in order to, to, to really do DR forecasting, we took an uh, initial run with this back in 2015 with Black and Beach. They did a terrific job. But we gave them lots of data. It's not just your typical customer billing data, 
Bug data, you know, 8760, uh, and the grid architecture and all that. We gave them uh, propensities, rhythm segments, uh, some other data and information. Right? You've got to add in cost trajectories of the technologies. And you, therefore, try to determine you know, what it is with regards to DR forecasting that is most attractive to residential customers. Right? For example, residential customers in single family homes in smart service territory, on average, stay in their homes about seven years. So they're, on average, moving about every seven years. Well, if you're going to make a 10 year investment, how are you really going to think about that? Honey, you're only going to be for seven years. Why would we invest in PV? We think that's one of the barriers that's created in terms of why isn't more widespread adoption of PV for I mentioned that we have SMUD AMI data, PV metering data. Uh, we are starting to acquire third party data as well. One of the areas of visibility that we lost when our, our center program ended was PV cost information. And the cost of PV is important to understanding the error forecast, in our opinion. Um, we reached, uh, last October, our board adopted an integrated resource plan, and now we are putting together our distributed resource plan. Uh, we actually call it the IDRP, or Integrated Resource Plan. Um, but the one thing I want to point out there is customer research. Right? A lot of those other things are, among my colleagues here, and kind of covered. Customer research. Customer research is very important for utility because that data and information, I think, will help guide everybody in making these decisions with regards to how the customers are going to behave, how they're going to respond, the technologies they're going to adopt, and how they're going to operate those technologies. Because you're going to, I think that we're, at least we're starting to think we're seeing conflicts and objectives. Utility wants to do this in terms of following policy and the directions by the regulators. But customers want to go in this direction and do that. How do you reconcile those two? Um, once again, I think it's, it's a lot of this is, is probably obvious. I was asked to kind of just touch upon how does one get started? How, how, does, how should a utility think about just even getting started with the DR forecast? Um, the two I want to highlight here is you got to establish your strategic objectives. We're migrating towards a strategic objective of leveraging customer investments in distributed energy resource technologies to do things like create non wires alternatives uh, to more on a, on a locational basis get customers to adopt technologies that we believe will benefit the grid. Our new strategic objective is reduce the carbon emission footprint of the entire smart service territory. It includes transportation, it includes building electrification. So these are some new things, but at least we have some guideposts in terms of what we want to do. And of course, I said customer research twice because we think it's that important to do customer research for utilities to do that customer research. Um, some final thoughts here. Um, you know, SMUD is still struggling with what is the value of DRs? Um, what is that locational value? Um, you know, great design, as we have learned, can either uh, inhibit or accelerate DR adoption. Uh, we're going to be rolling out a pilot where we actually have a device, not a device, a system that will send price signals to customers, uh, devices. Uh, we're working with a couple of companies to, to see how that's going to work. And, you know, it's, it's, I think, a bit early in the game in order to really understand the value of DERs and finally, it's a moving target. It, 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 every year, it seems to change. And it's the cost of technologies coming down. We're seeing uh, residential customers adopt solar PV plus storage. But it's not economically beneficial yet at this time, so why are they doing it? Well, do your research. You ask them, why are you doing that? Some peace of mind. Yeah, we know it's expensive. I can't that. But interestingly enough, when you dig a little deeper, you realize they are leasing these systems. The third party that is leasing these systems have other ideas as well. They want to create virtual power plants, they want to create microgrids, they want to participate in the wholesale market. Right? Cal, Cal ISOs, in my opinion, start to open the doors for more DRs to play. So, so, certainly a lot of things to think about. 
And I think that we're on the cusp of this, uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And you, toward the end, answered the question I was going to ask you, but just one, one question quickly, and I want to get to the commissioners around the table before we run out of time. As you were using your example of a case study and exploring uh, that metering and some changes in that metering 2.0, and you went up to pursuing one and then ran into problems, you left sort of the regulator's equivalent of a cliffhanging story there. So because what comes next? Is it just business as usual, or is there something else coming? Uh, what comes next is we hire a consultant. <laughs> Um, we may explore value of solar as one, one alternative, okay. but, but yeah, it's, we need someone to come in with some horsepower to help us think this. Kind of relates to our previous session of, you know, it's a very specific example of that. Commissioners, first, and around the table looking for uh, anything from you, and uh, at least who will make eye contact with me first. Uh, and, and while you're thinking of that, let me ask the three of you then. Uh, and then, or in anyone out in the audience, if you have any questions in particular, what I'm looking for, and I think you've all touched on it in different ways, but two commissioners, two commissions, if not to utilities as well, if, if we're at a place where we're actually, this may well be going on in the utilities where it regulate, but we're not even sure of that, where's the good first place to start this engagement? And uh, it's a, after talking about strategic objectives, that's an interesting hook to kind of talk about where are we trying to go versus just saying, hey, you doing load forecasting in DRs? You know, and how, how to make this engaging and informative? What's the thing we should pursue first uh, versus just taking the whole enchilada all at once? Is there a particular place to engage this? Does it fit best in a particular kind of proceeding? What's the best way to bring this from, if you're not doing much, to into the regulatory arena in an appropriate and helpful way? Any thoughts on that? In my opinion, it, I would suggest it's, it's kind of easy for us in California because the policymakers have already established goals. They've established a policy uh, working with the regulators like the California Public Utilities Commission and the California Energy Commission to start to kind of define how that's going to work. For a municipality like us, then, we have to make a decision. Do we follow what the PC is doing or do we do it? But I, I think since, since the policy has been established, it's a little easy. Any advice? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, one thing I think to do is to start where you're already at. If you're a state with integrated resource planning, you can start to dig a little bit deeper into the um, DER projections that are associated with that or any other um, you know, dockets that might include um, projections of distributed energy resources. Um, yeah, so just, and then making sure there's consistent inputs between different um, dockets, if there's IRP, if there's some sort of distribution system planning, kind of making sure that the projections are consistent. Um, and I think the way that Minnesota and Oregon started is with some surveys um, and some stakeholder meetings to talk about, you know, how can we be sure that the, cost of the investments that are being made are in the best interest to try and bring, just increase transparency uh, is another good way. Very helpful. Thanks. Did you have something to add to that? I think just answer, asking the simple question, how could you show me how you make the risk assessment on your network relative to the adoption of DER for the next 10 years? How do you do it? Very good. It's right to the point. Audience, uh, the last word from any of you wishing to kind of sum this all up, any or any other particular question uh, to have. I'm not seeing any, and which is fine because it's 345 as well. So, so with that, you have done wonderful work here. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, please help me thank the three panelists. With that, you're right on schedule for a 345 break, and uh, I think there's one more session at 4 o'clock. Thank you very much. Oh, oh and uh, thank you. And that is a combined session with the gas committee, and it's in uh, rooms 8, 9, and 10. So it is not in here.